So let's consider uniaxial deformation of a rubber. So we're just going to pull essentially uh, deformation just in the one direction. So one direction, one axis, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to extend our material. Alpha 1 is just the change in L1, L0. What's going to happen in the two or three direction? Well, we're not sure, but we have our incompressibility expression, right? And we should know that 2 and 3, just because they're transverse, if we're linear isotropic, they should behave the same. So these are two unknowns that will behave exactly the same. So we have alpha 1, basically x squared equals basically 1. So if we rearrange this, we should know that x squared equals 1 over alpha 1. And then that's how we get to these expressions here. So thank goodness for that incompressibility conservation of volume expression. So when we do that, we can rewrite delta S, which we kind of just had previously in our last page over here. We could write delta S just simply in terms of alpha 1. Um, so we get that expression right here. And we know that the force, so my change in the force in one direction, is just going to be minus T and then dS dL. So I can write this expression like this. And I don't really want to work with L's because I have this really nice expression in terms of alpha. And I don't really want to write out my L1s and, you know, I mean, I could do that in principle. Um, but actually, we could do that right now. You know, you could do that actually quite easily. But uh, we don't really want to get too deep into that. Actually, let's do a, try to let's play around with it. So if I do minus T and then K over 2. If I just take it with respect to L1, so alpha 1 is equal to L1 divided by L0, and then plus 2 over L1, and then L0 over here, minus 3. So if I take this derivative of delta S with respect to this, so I should have minus K, to K over 2, and then let's do this uh, alpha 1. Actually, excuse me, what am I doing here? So alpha 1 squared. Actually, let's go ahead and do this in Mathematica. That'll be a little bit easier. So, delta S equals minus K. I'm going to clear K. I'm just going to clear everything here. Sorry about that quick change in plan. I just wanted to. You could do chain rule and do all these kind of fun things, but we actually have the expression right here. So, delta S equals minus K divided by 2. Two times alpha one squared plus two divided by alpha one minus three. So when we do that, I take the derivative, derivative of delta s with respect to. Okay, let me plug in. Uh, and actually, let me say that alpha one equals l one divided by l naught. So we got that. Plug that back in this bad boy here. I don't know why I have a negative negative, but I'm actually getting ahead of the game. But we have that. So I need to take the derivative. So actually minus t times the derivative of delta s with respect to L1. Get that out. Let's do let's do full simplify. And let's see our expression. So L1 divided by L naught squared. Actually, let's see. It's KT. It's actually, yeah, we can break this down. Hopefully, this stays up. Uh, can I? So I have K. Oops. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. So let's redistribute the L naughts so it could look like that. So let's see if they match. So it's KT um, basically over alpha is L1 divided by L0 uh, squared minus KT times 1 over alpha, uh, alpha 1 squared. Alpha 1 is equal to L1 divided by L0. So that'd be squared squared, but it's flipped. So I would do basically L0 squared uh, divided by L1 squared, but the L0 here cancels out here, so it should be like this. So let's see if that makes sense. So KT, let's see, KT, L1 over L0 squared, perfect, minus KT, L0 over L1 squared, fantastic. So we skip, we jump the line, and now we're good to go. So you can rewrite that in terms of alpha or L1s. I mean, I think that's why we want to keep it in terms of alpha, so you could do the chain rule, but anyways, we got to the expression. Fun. So 
that's our force. So we can find the stress now divided by the cross-sectional area. And we know that's the 2, 3 plane. We'll call that A naught. So um, we looked at it from a single chain, but we would know stress for the whole network. So there's a number, Z again, of subchains per volume. And so we can use that expression and get the following. So Z, F1, again, we could plug that in, A naught. Um, and we could simplify here. So we could say that this is our volume, A naught times L naught. And then Z per volume, Z over V, is going to be our number of crosslinks, which makes sense. Number of crosslinks per unit volume. Um, so, but we said that we typically write the restoring force in terms of the molecular mass. So remember that M sub X. So that's going to be our mass per unit volume. So again, it's going to be the density, uh, mass, per, mass of polymer per unit volume divided by the number of subchains per unit volume. So that's going to be essentially the density divided by the number of subchains per unit volume. So density over Avogadro's number. And that's going to give us this M sub X. We could plug that in back into here. And we get this very, very important expression. And again, there's a couple of typos in here. So not sigma X, sigma 1, but it's X. You know, all of those other good stuff. Um, so we can write the stress uh, as a function of the strain as well. So we know that the extension is L1 divided by L0. So so that is essentially L0 plus delta L over L0. So that's my change in that deformation. So I could rewrite this. And my alpha 1 is equal to effectively this. So 1, it's my new deformation, 1 plus E1. Very similar to kind of almost like the true stress expression. But anyways, true strain expression. So we get that. We can plug in. Again, we have stress in terms of alpha. But we could relate alpha to strain. Plug this back into the expressions here. And you'll see this very, very, very important expression. So stress is this constant plus this times this strain. So stress times a constant times linear in strain. And then, again, typically for small strains, again, most materials at 0 or at 0 0.002 or 0.0. You know, anyways, those are linear. So in the limit of small strains, we find our Young's modulus is this. And this is super important. We see that the Young's modulus actually increases with temperature, and it decreases with the molecular uh, weight of the crosslinks. This one makes sense, right? Because if I have more crosslinks, if I have more of these sticking points, I'm going to have more basically elastic response. But the temperature one is so interesting. Why is that? It's because as I increase temperature, and I'm stressing, you know, as I increase temperature, that entropy term becomes much more important. So my little spaghetti wants to kind of relax back, but I'm stretching my polymer, and as it increased temperature, it, that entropic restoring, restoring force, restoring force, excuse me, wants to push back even further. So you get this even greater elastic response. So it's so cool, and we're gonna actually watch a video uh, pretty soon. Um, they're gonna show if you actually have rubber bands and you attach it. You can feel the heat that's generated from a rubber band as you kind of pull it. Um, uh, but it's a really, really cool kind of uh, idea. So it's super, super interesting. Again, opposite of ceramics and metals, right? As we increase temperature there, typically your modulus will decrease. Now, there are some limits in terms of when this works. So strain-induced crystallization. So one of our assumptions was we don't have any crystallization. That usually happens when you start to, again, we saw it for drawing as well for some of our uh, stress-strain curves. Um, again, as you kind of stretch it, if you stretch your polymer too far, your subchain is going to reach the contour length. And again, we're not, we're pulling on the covalent bond, essentially. Um, and then your Young's modulus, you're going to get this, super increase in your stress strain curve. Um, bonds rotate away from the trans state. Uh, again, you have dangling ends, system drops below TG. Again, then we're pulling on essentially these bonds. We're looking at you know some of these other materials. So uh, the framework doesn't work. Too many crosslinks. Again, we can't be Gaussian at that point if there's too many crosslinks. Too few crosslinks, we're just going to get essentially slip. Um, but again, this is a very, very, very powerful. And again, I can't emphasize enough this, this finding. It's so cool. Polymers are the best material. <laughs> Anyways, uh, next time we'll get into Poisson's ratio and then develop a lot of these other cool um, kind of frameworks for how do we deal with constitutive relationships between stress and strain. And then don't you worry, lots of fun problems are coming to you and then your old friend more circle. So I will see you all in the next video. Thanks. Bye.